Hallelujah. Please be seated. Welcome to today's worship experience. God bless you. If you're joining us online, this is the Well Oasis International, where sons come to manifest. Hallelujah. And if it's your first time joining us, we welcome you. We are glad to see you. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Um, as we know, we are in, in the series, Echoes of the Heart. And this is most likely a nine-part series. But today is part number three. Hallelujah. Echoes of the Heart is a focus or a review of the Lord's, the one, the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, really, which is actually the disciples' prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, used to teach his disciples how to pray. Amen. If you remember, the first time we introduced on, on, on Father's Day, we introduced the concept of God as our Father. Hallelujah. Then the following Sunday, we started the series proper, Echoes of the Heart, and we looked at Father God. Hallelujah. And we saw what it meant for Jesus to say, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. If you remember, I told us that the reason why he's our father is that he's close to us. We have proximity, and therefore we can go to him as a child will go to his, because he's our father. We can go, he's close enough for you to get on his laps. That's our father, and he's in heaven, who art in heaven, enough for you to remember that he's sovereign regardless. Hallelujah. There are two words, two big words that we used to describe God that day. We talked about the immanence of God and then the transcendence of God. The immanence of God is where the name Emmanuel comes from, God with us, which means that he's right where we are. And then the transcendence of God is what speaks to his sovereignty and his almightiness. Hallelujah. Last week we looked at hallowed be thy name. And we looked at the word hallow. We said it is to set apart to declare something as holy or sacred. And so when you come to God and you're praying to God and you begin with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It collapses everything in honor, respect, regard, reverence, and puts it into one for how. So that we never lose the understanding or we never make the mistake of thinking that because he's our Father, he loses his place as God Almighty. Hallelujah. And we looked at his names. We said that a man's name speaks about his character. And so when you think about the names of God, why the Bible says, hallowed be thy name, is because there is something about the name of God. The Bible says that Jesus has been given a name that is above every other name. And at the mention of his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. We looked at his different names, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sikenu, Jehovah El Erioi, Jehovah El Elyon, Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah El Sabuat, Elohim. We saw them and we saw the attributes that that. Uh, the attributes, the names describe a part of God. And we try to look at God in this massive, I don't know the words for him, to see that there is nothing that we need that is not found in his name. There is a name for everything that you need. You want him to provide for you his Jehovah what? Jireh. You want him to heal you his what? Jehovah Rapha, you, you want him to cover you, he's Jehovah Nisi, my banner. Hallelujah. You want him to fight for you, he's Jehovah Sabuat, the man of war. So everything we need in God or we want in God is captured in the name of God. That's why Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he said, pray and say it like this. Our Father, you need to know that this person that is all of these things is first and foremost your Father. So when you come to God in prayer, you are not coming to him afraid you're, because you're coming to your family member. Do you see that? Today we are moving on to 
thy kingdom come. When we started, I told us, I said, look, do not look at this prayer as this prayer you recite. Because the tendency is we can approach this prayer or this model of prayer as something we say. I like to say the Lord's Prayer or, yeah, we call it the Lord's Prayer generally. When I wake up, when I become conscious of my bed, it's the first thing I say to myself. My Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day your daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses as I trespass against you. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Then I begin to take these elements and I begin to pray for my children. I begin to pray to my, for my husband. I begin to speak about the wealth. Inside of this prayer, so this prayer is not just nine or ten lines that we say every time and that is all. There is more to this prayer and what we are trying to do by the series Echoes of the Heart, first and foremost, even by the, the theme or the name, I want you to see that prayer ought to be something that emanates from deep within. So you are not supposed to be flippant about it. My father has heaven. You know how we do now. We may have been taught like that, but that's not what Jesus meant. Hallelujah. So as we continue today, we are looking at thy kingdom come. Hmm. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. How did Jesus move from my father who is in heaven to hallowed be your name? And the next thing we hear is thy kingdom come. What is it about the kingdom of God? Why is this the next thing that Jesus wants us to consider and contemplate in the place of prayer. Because this is not just a declaration. It is a commitment. It is a contemplation. It explains and opens to us a number of things inside of this one line, thy kingdom come. So in reviewing thy kingdom come today, we want to look at three things. What is the kingdom of God? Or what is God's kingdom? The second thing we want to look at is what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? The third thing we want to see is what is my part in thy kingdom come? Am I just going to say it and fold my hands and sit for the kingdom to come? Is there something specially that I need to do for the kingdom of God to come? But of course we will begin with what is God's kingdom? A lot of us typically think, in fact, when you go out and you talk to, especially those, even in, even in church, you know, people come because they want to go to heaven. And that's a great thing. We want to go to heaven. But when you ask them, where is heaven? They point up. I mean, that's our mindset. Now, heaven is up. Hell is down. Isn't it? That's our mindset. But what if I told you that heaven is not up? Somebody will be like, ah, she's speaking. She's about to speak blasphemy. The kingdom of God is not a territory. The kingdom of God is not somewhere we go. That's why, you know, I thank God for COVID. Somebody did not say amen. Thank God for COVID. Because one big lesson from COVID is that we can worship God wherever. Hallelujah. Not supposed to be so all the time. Because the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of the brethren together. But they had become something we have done about the house, about the building, about the location that started to make the relationship or the idea or the, or the principle of kingdom alien to us. So kingdom is not territory. Because if kingdom is territory, is it Catholic, is it Anglican, is it four square, is it round square, is it triangle square, which one is it? Which one will be the king? Because if we understood that kingdom is not territory, all these lines that divide us will not exist. The kingdom of God is not a territory. The kingdom of God is, is where the rule of God is. Where the rule of the, or the reign of God is. It's not, it's, oh God, help me. I need words today, Lord. You need to give me the right words. The kingdom of God is not a territory. It is not, so you can't sit here and say, oh, the kingdom of God is only in the Christian nations. 
So if you go to the Middle East, the kingdom of God is not there. You cannot sit down, stand, sit here now because you made it this Sunday and begin to feel cool with yourself and say the kingdom of God is in charge. Because there's, in some prisons, there's more kingdom of God than there is in church. I can shock you and say there are brothels that have more kingdom of God than church. Huh? Because the kingdom of God is not brick and mortar. The kingdom of God is not a nation that says we are Christian. The kingdom of God is wherever the rule and the reign of God is manifest. Wherever the rule or the reign of God is manifest is what? So it is not a territory. What this means is that wherever a representative of God's kingdom acts in a manner that glorifies God to alter the status quo and bring change and transformation, guess what? God's kingdom landed there, Neo. So if somebody stole and went to prison, and right there in prison, there's someone else who killed somebody who is in prison. But that person had become born again and he had become pastor there. And the person who stole, who came in, who just got, uh, got into prison, starts to be mentored or discipled by the one who had committed murder and was, you know, has been sentenced to life imprisonment, let's say that. But this person who is on death row or, or life imprisonment, Walks with and this one who came in as a thief to the extent that this one who came in as a thief becomes born again and begins to be discipled and begins to want to obey God and begins to transform his life. The kingdom of God showed up in prison. And that's why we cannot look at someone and say, ah. Because if he were about how we dressed... Some people would have gone to heaven by now. If you were about how we did in the days of big Bibles, if you were about the size of our Bibles, if you were about who said the loudest hallelujah and amen, some of us will not see kingdom. Kingdom of God for don't finish. Because the people, if, if it was about the people who had money, therefore don't buy and finish, it would now become exclusive real estate. But thank God, the kingdom of God is not real estate. <laughs> hey, you know now, they will not buy it. They don't, they don't care about the God, but they will buy the kingdom. They will make Jesus an offer I can't refuse. Do you get it? So the kingdom of God is not what? It's not a territory. It's not a place. The kingdom of God is wherever the rule of God is manifest. So sometimes the kingdom of God is a business. Sometimes the kingdom of God is the life of a man. Sometimes the kingdom of God is a marriage. Wherever men represent God enough to trigger change and transformation that glorifies God, that's the kingdom. That's why they said righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. So these are three things. Wherever you see righteousness, wherever you see peace, wherever you see joy in the Holy Ghost, kingdom has landed. So poor men live in kingdom. They may not have eaten for two days, but as long as they are standing in righteousness, they have peace in their marriage, even though they never chop. And somehow they have a joy that no man can explain. Guess what? That's the kingdom of God. I think that I like the fact that that's what kingdom is. Because all this high horse thing we do, where we think that we are the best, that happen, best thing that happened to Christianity, it just knocks us off that whatever. Because that's not what it is. Hallelujah. The word kingdom is taken from the root word basilia or basilia. Basilia means the reign of a king. Can you see it? The word kingdom is taken from a word basilia, B-A-S-I-L-E-I-A. And basilia means the reign of a king. The reign of a king. What therefore qualifies a territory as God's territory or domain 
which in this case can be the life, like I said, of a person, his finances, his marriage, his business, his neighborhood, or even a nation, what qualifies something as a territory or, or, or somewhere or somewhere where God's kingdom is, the prevail, is in prevalence is how God's rule shows up. Wherever it is, the conversation is Jesus is Lord. Wherever the conversation, men defer to God. Wherever men align with the commandments of God. Wherever men submit to the will of God. That is the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Wherever God's rule is manifest. Because, you see, Jesus said, he said, um, how did he say it? He said, um, number one, he said, you did not choose me. I chose you. And then he said, he said, no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, if you put the two together, we must, you must have come to the Father to be part of the kingdom, yes? But you cannot come to the Father unless Jesus chose you. So therefore, kingdom is wherever God is. And, and you know... <laughs> Because the kingdom of God, what is the most visible manifestation of God's kingdom? Who knows? The most visible manifestation of God's kingdom is authority. Is authority. So wherever we see the authority of God, that is the kingdom of God. See, if you are walking by the road and someone is ill and you stop and you lay hands on the person and you pray in Jesus' name and the person is healed, the kingdom of God just came down. Because what you did was you, 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 you drew down what the man couldn't see before. Now he can see God anywhere he goes from that day on. When they call Jehovah Rapha, he will do like this. If you say what, you say, I know that Jehovah. So which one? The one that heals people. Do you understand it? So the kingdom of God has to be experienced to be real. Consequently, wherever God is, wherever he's properly represented, wherever men or creation defer to his will, his kingdom has come. Therefore, two people can be at the same exact physical location and one is within God's kingdom. And the other is not. So right here in this church, as we are inside this room right now, there are people that are in the kingdom. And God forbid, there are people that are not in the kingdom. You are the one that determines. Do you see that? What I'm trying to say, I don't know if I'm succeeding, is that the boundaries of God's kingdom cannot therefore be determined by mountains and hills and valleys or rivers. The boundaries of God's kingdom cannot be determined by fences, walls, flags, and pillars. The boundaries of God's, uh, God's kingdom are represented by his manifest authority. By his manifest authority. So the most essential econ uh, uh, commodity of kingdom is authority. That's what God ceded to us. God delegated the authority over the earth to man in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And because of that, man can show up and Jesus will show up. If man can show up, Jesus can show up. That is, man can go somewhere where nobody knew about Jesus. But because that man got there and he already knew about Jesus, the moment he shows up and he begins to, you know, posture with what he knows and who he knows. Guess what? Jesus shows up. Just guess what? The kingdom of God is manifest. Hallelujah. So God's kingdom is therefore a territory or place. In, is therefore a territory or place. Is therefore not a territory or place in this world. If you go with me to John 18 verse 36. John chapter 18 verse number 36. Let's look at that quickly. John 18 Verse 36. It's Jesus replied, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Nor does it have its origin in this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard. 
to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. You know, when we read it, we think that it's because Jesus was going to die. And then, of course, by his death, he was going to resurrect and return to heaven. So we think Jesus is saying that as I die now, you know, as, you know if I, because it is because I don't belong in the earth, that's why I'm going to die. That's why my, my disciples are now fighting to keep me here on earth. But that's not what it is. Really what he's saying is, you know, he said it in another way somewhere that we should do what? Therefore, we should focus on the things that are above. I think it's in Colossians. Rather than the things that are in beneath. What he's saying is that the things that make for my kingdom are not the things you can touch. They are not the things you can touch. If you look at Luke 17. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Luke 17, verse 20 and 21. Give me a moment together. Yeah. It says, now having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he replied, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed or with a visible display. No, when people say, look, here it is or there it is. For the kingdom of God is among you because of my presence. If you read it in the Amplified, because of my presence. So wherever Jesus and, for lack of a better word, the ideology that he came to propagate shows up, the kingdom of God has shown up. That's why Jesus, all of his conversation was about kingdom. Because he knew, even though the Jews were now afraid and the Jews were, were looking for a physical king who would come and would you know, sit on a throne and would have a crown on his head and would fight their battles for them and take them out of this um, slavery of, from the Greeks and the Romans. It was the one reason they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe that a king, that their Messiah was going to show up as a man. Do you understand it? They didn't understand it. Meanwhile, that was exactly what was necessary if he was going to save mankind. Jesus the divine could not have saved you. Because Jesus the divine has no blood to shed. And unless there's a shedding of blood, there cannot be remission of sins. But they were so overwhelmed or so focused on the fact that our king must have power. That they couldn't bear, this bear to, or even dare to understand and embrace the fact that the God, that the, the Messiah came in the form of man. Do you understand it? So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you because of my presence. He was saying that wherever I am received and accepted and embraced. That is where the kingdom of God is. It was the reason why even when Jesus was going back. He said, I will not leave you alone because there must be a manifestation of God in our midst for the kingdom of God to be in our midst. Do you understand that? So when he was living in person, he said, Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit is even better. Holy Spirit is not confined to a body. So Holy Spirit can be on all of us at the same time. Why? Because the kingdom of God has now tabernacled with men. Hallelujah. So God's kingdom is not a place for all of us that are waiting to die and go to heaven. Hallelujah. Let me not say anything. This series is not on the kingdom of God. This series is on the Lord's Prayer. So this is just me. I, I, if I want to teach the kingdom of God, it's probably be like a 20-part series. And I've been threatening to teach it for like three years now. But I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I think after this, I will go to the kingdom. And we'll probably be in it to the end of 2024 if Jesus tarries. But it will be worth it because a lot of the conversations, the wrong conversations and the wrong attitude we have in the body of Christ is because we do not understand the concept of kingdom. Hallelujah. Number two, the kingdom of God is there for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you look at Romans 14, 17. It is wherever the character and characteristics of God are put on display. 
So the kingdom of God, that's what Romans 14, 7 says. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. These three things, where, where do you find them? They are characteristics of God. Peace and joy are fruit of the spirit. So it takes the spirit to be in someone's life. For the person to be able to live in righteousness. For the person to have peace. And for the person to have joy. So again, where the spirit of God is manifest, there you find what? The kingdom of God. Number three, I saw that we have been given the keys to the kingdom. The kingdom is not a place, but it has keys. And the keys be given to us. The Bible says that God has given us the authority to bind and to lose. And I said that the greatest manifestation of kingdom is authority. It's the greatest manifestation of kingdom. That's why an ordinary man will walk into a place and he's ordinary and ordinary and ordinary until he lays hands on a sick person. Do you see it? And when he lays hands on a sick person, it's not because he laid his hands. It's not theater. It's just the power of God. Booms. Because in that moment, the man is opened himself up by faith for God of God to take over him to be able to reach to someone and bring about the good that God has ordained for that moment. Hallelujah. So we have the keys to the kingdom. As many as have received him, he gave the right. You can call what? The sons of God. Are you going to be the sons of a God who is the king of this kingdom and not have access to the kingdom? We've been given the keys. Number four, God's kingdom is where his will is esteemed as superior. In this um, um, uh, local assembly, we have looked at the will of God. How many of us remember? We're in the will of God for like, I think, 13 or 14 months, uh, weeks rather. I don't remember. But the point is, when we looked at the will of God, you saw that the will of God is not what we thought it was. So the will of God is not, I did not die. Because sometimes dying exactly is the will of God. <laughs> Praise Jesus. So wherever God's kingdom, God's kingdom is wherever his will is esteemed as superior. Men who surrender their will to God's will establish his rule and his reign in their lives. And therefore they establish his kingdom. So that's why the Bible says, see thou a man diligent in his ways. It's not the expertise of the work of his hands alone that we're talking about. Diligent in his ways talk about worship, a lifestyle of worship before God. If you find a man who lives like that, he says he will stand before what? Kings and not mean men. Who are the people who have access to kings? Kings have access to kings. Do you get it? I bet how many of you are, you and me are going to go and knock on, on okay, it's no longer Buhari, right? <laughs> President Tinubu's door. So you be. Say my name, Nabitim. He say, I know. Do I know you? Who even born you to knock on the door? Who be you? Who you be? Yes. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is revealed in the lordship of Jesus. Such that everything Jesus accomplished became both the revealing, manifesting, and establishing of God's kingdom. If I had to look at this, if I had a scripture for it, it would probably be Luke 4, 18. But I like the Isaiah 61 um, 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 version of that scripture more. Isaiah 61. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed and commissioned me to bring good news to the humble and afflicted. So number one, if you have been anointed and commissioned to bring good news to the affliction, afflicted and the humble, guess what? You are establishing the kingdom of God. Do you see it? Number two, he has sent me to bind the wounds of the brokenhearted, to proclaim release from confinement and condemnation to the physical and spiritual captives and freedom to prisoners. If you do any of this in Jesus' name, you are, <laughs> you are establishing the kingdom of God. Because here's the thing that happens. Anywhere the kingdom of God truly shows up, change, positive change comes. Sick people become well. Do you understand it? Afflicted people get 
released or delivered. Captives are set free. When they ask, what do you say Jesus did it? That's the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, when you pray, say, thy kingdom come. Jesus wanted us to, I, I'm running ahead, but let me not go that fast. Let me pull myself back. In verse 2 of, of Isaiah 61, it says to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance and retribution of our God. Ha, the two of them the same time. The kingdom of God can show up when the judgment of God shows up. Just the same way the kingdom of God can show up, show up when the favor of God shows up. So again, if only good things are indicative of the kingdom of God, it will not be the kingdom. That's why I say that the greatest manifestation of the kingdom of God is what? Authority. 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 And the beauty of authority is, and no, it's not today's, but they went in my head, may I talk and make I just talk and. The beauty of authority is that everything that Jesus had in authority said, I have given you all authority. You know, you, we read it as power. Then it's a translation problem. But it said, I've given you the authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions. And nothing shall by any means harm you, even if you drank poison. So in a nutshell, because this, today's teaching is not about the kingdom. I don't want to start a series on the kingdom. We won't stop for 40 weeks. So let me just explain to you what I'm, I've been saying since. What I've been saying since is what is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. Wherever the rule of God is acknowledged, submitted to, and celebrated, that place becomes the kingdom of God. So whether it's a cathedral, or a touch shed somewhere, or a, sh uh, or a basher by the barbage. As long as God is proclaimed in spirit and in truth in that place, the kingdom of God has come. That's why the Bible says it like this. It says God does not dwell in houses built by hands of men. Because a lot of us are trying to build God house. Because we just want to put on top of it, kingdom of God, I wish. Hallelujah. So the question is, or our next question is, what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? If the kingdom of God is wherever the rule of God is prevalent or manifest, what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? At creation in Genesis 1.28, God blessed man. If you read it in the Amplified Translation, it says, God blessed man, granting them a certain authority. You should read your Bible. God blessed man. What we see in King James, I say, God blessed them, and then he said, be fruitful. The, in, in the Amplified, it says, God blessed man. How, what is this blessing? He gave them a certain authority authority. And the word certain is used because the kind, even though all authority will ultimately, when we utilize every authority, points men to Jesus, the way I do it is not how you do it. So for each one of us, according to what God put in us, in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, we can exercise a certain authority. So God blessed man. The blessing of God on man is that God gave man a certain authority. What does this certain authority give us? The details of this certain authority empowers and enables man to do five things. Number one, to be fruitful. It's a certain authority that makes a man fruitful. To produce what God wants him to produce. Number two, multiply. It's a certain authority from God that makes man multiply. Number three, feed or replenish the earth. Number four, subdue or subjugate the earth. That is put it under your power. It takes authority to exercise power. 
In Africa, our African Christians, we lack power. Everything is about power, 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 power. But you see, when we see the policeman on the road, and you are driving, and all of a sudden he steps out from behind something, and he does like this, you stop, right? It's not because of his gun you stopped. And it's not because he did like this that you stopped. Because who is he? I don't know his name. I don't care for him. But he's wearing a uniform. And that uniform is the uniform of the Nigerian police force. When that one man, whether he's a good cop or a bad cop, steps in the road and does like this, I have to stop, but I'm not stopping for him. I'm stopping for the authority that the Federal Republic of Nigeria is reposed in him or delegated to him. Do you see that? So God blessed man by giving man a certain authority. I'm trying to explain to you what it means for the kingdom of God to come. So when Jesus said, pray and say, thy kingdom come, Jesus was saying, pray. Because the things that I've called you to achieve on the earth, no man can do it by himself. I have to, my certain authority has to be upon him. And then when my certain authority is upon him, he can produce, he can multiply, he can replenish, he can subdue, and he can have dominion. And then when those things happen in real time, men say, glory to God. To say, ah, I give glory to God today. You know, I just entered that place and something, 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 something happened to me. And then that thing happened to me. I didn't know what to do. One, one lady or one man just showed up and he looked at me and said, what is it? And I said, oh, this, 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 this. And he said to me, wait, I'm coming. And he went into a room and came back and gave me that thing. Ah, help me thank God, though. You know, when we give those testimonies, we never say, let me thank the person. Because 80% of the time, the person is nowhere to be found. But we always say, help me thank God. So, in another way, the kingdom of God comes when God, a man does something enough for another man to say, help me thank God. When God gets the glory from anything you do or do, or I do, the kingdom of God has shown up. That is what it means for the kingdom to come. So Jesus was saying, pray really hard. You know, when you are praying this prayer, be in a contemplative mode to say, Lord, I don't just want to experience the flash of you. I want it to be that you are so uh, manifest in my life that I do things, the things you enable me to do will change someone and not for them to give glory to your name. Because back then, revelation would now become a reality. Because we were created for his pleasure. Do you see it? Do you see it? Or am I just talking? Because I'm trying really hard, I promise you. So when we therefore pray thy kingdom come, what we are saying is that number one, God should empower us to live our lives to prove and as proof that he is our sovereign. God. Father, my Father who is in heaven, the God that is so near to me and yet very big, I am bowing before your name today because your name is a key to resolve many things that will stand against me in life. Let your kingdom come. Father, what I'm saying is anywhere you send me, May I not go there and something cannot happen that we glorify your name. Lord, I'm praying today that your kingdom will come. Whether I go to the market or I go to the hospital or I go to school or I come to church. Let it be that I live a fragrance of you in, in that place. Can you see that ordinary thy kingdom come has become something else? So when we say thy kingdom come, we are saying, God, Joe, let my life be proof. And may I live to prove that you are my sovereign or you are my principal. You know what that means, right? 
when you say someone has a principal, it means that, you know, in government officials, it means that that is the person they report to. You say, my principal, my principal, my principal. What that person is saying is, my entire life I live for this person. In this moment, whether for one year or the next two years, if you are truthful to yourself, everything that you are living is to ensure that the vision of your principal comes to pass. So when we say your kingdom come, what it does mean for us is that our lives will become proof and our lives will prove that God is sovereign. What that means is there are things that will happen to us that will almost kill us. But you know, sometimes, and that because we survive, people will say, God, deal. We are saying, Lord, let your rule be seen in how we be and how we do. Let your rule be seen in how we be and how we do. Let it not be that I claim to be a son of God and men cannot see it. They cannot attest. May it not be that it's with my mouth I have to tell you. I don't know whether this makes sense. May it not be that, eh, you say, ah, eh, you say, make I tell you I be Christian. Oh. If you have to announce you are a Christian, you are not a Christian. Huh? I mean, most of I said, if you have to announce it, it's taking too many words. Because have you forgotten the saying that says, preach the gospel? If necessary, use words. Number two, when we say that kingdom come, what does it mean? It is a declaration of our loyalty to God and his will. When I, I, when I was, you know, trying to research this today, I realized that it's a declaration, it is a prayer, it is a rebellion, this one statement. It's a declaration that, Lord, I'm loyal. Oh. If you are from a do state, one will say, I'm loyal. You know what I mean? I say, Baba, we loyal. It means that by your side, I did. Don't mind what you they see around here. I'm loyal to you. When the kingdom of God comes, or when we say that kingdom come, or when the kingdom of God shows up, it proves our loyalty to God, yes, and his will. But it is also our cry that the God of this world be toppled. Because the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. Abi, did you see it in your Bible? So when you say thy kingdom come, you are crying out to God and say, God, this place will be as it gets. It is not looking like you said it should be. Everything no set at all. So God, I beg, just move. Do something. If possible, do and through me. So that this devil will go fall on his face. Make everybody know that you be God. Automatically, we are saying, my allegiance is to the cross. Anything untied the cross, I'm against it. Lord, use me to bring down the kingdom of the... Is, so, thy kingdom come is engaging, is inviting warfare. <laughs> That's the one Christians don't like. You know, we all do just like that kingdom come where no pleasure shows up. But in the same vein that you are screaming, thy kingdom come, and everybody screaming, God is coming, we can see his glory. The God of this world that you are now trying to dispossess or topple, do you think he's going to go to sleep? So that kingdom come is an invitation or an enlistment in battle. You are saying, God, use me to fight this one in this small place. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse number 15. Colossians 2, 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, <laughs> those supernatural forces of evil against, operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphant procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. So when you say, let your kingdom come, 
You are saying, Lord, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Let all men know that you alone are the God. When the kingdom of God comes, if you look at 1 John chapter number 2, 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 to 17, 1 John 2 15 to 17, it says, do not love the word of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensu sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. So when you say, thy kingdom come, again you are saying, Lord, anything that is in my life that makes me hooked up, on that sensual, lustful life. I am saying, strip me of them. So that I can be lean and mean for kingdom work. Hallelujah. When we say thy kingdom come, what does it mean? It is the expression of our desire to see that God rules in the affairs of men. And saves the souls that are perishing through ignorance. So when you are saying thy kingdom come, essentially you are saying let the light of God shine. That men may know the length and the breadth. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 18. That men may be able to see the glory of God through Christ. That men may know what it is that Christ has made available. Thy kingdom come. Because the Bible says something. It says the God of this world, what does he do? He blinds eyes. So when you get in a situation and you perceive that the people are blind, you need to quickly recognize that no matter what you say to them, they cannot be liberated unless they can see. So when you get there, thy kingdom come becomes Ephesians chapter 1. I want us to read it. Thy kingdom come. That, that's those thy kingdom come. Those three words, they become Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Let me read it. I always pray. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that gives you a deep and personal and intimate insight into the true knowledge of Him. For we know the God through the Son, we know the Father through the Son. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope. The divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people. Thy kingdom come, three words. How many words did I just read? It's the same thing that we're saying. So Jesus took all these many things in the Bible and he distilled them into nine sentences, yeah? But everything you see in that short prayer... You find it in Genesis through to Revelation. So what Jesus was saying when he taught his, his disciples to pray and by extension taught us to pray is that you can take this model of prayer and it becomes how you see your responsibility, how you determine or descend your responsibility. It becomes how you descend your power. It becomes how you descend your tribe. It becomes how... It, there's so many things packed in this model prayer. I keep saying it's not the Lord's prayer because the Lord's prayer is found in John 17 when he actually prayed. Hallelujah. So for instance, for one person, that kingdom come is a prayer that unbelievers will be reached and they will be converted. That's a missional prayer that is flowing out of thy kingdom come. Do you see it? Acts chapter 1 verse 7. Acts chapter 1 verse number 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs 
which the Father has fixed for his own authority. But you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. So when the kingdom of God came upon the disciples in the upper room, they went to the different places. Why? To tell them about Jesus. A kingdom go, if, if you ask me, it, it, thy kingdom come, I walk in this second prayer more. It is how, it is my setting authority. My setting authority is that believers remain in Christ and mature in him. That's another part of thy kingdom come. Do you see it? The one who, you know, is missional is not wrong. The one who is maturing is not wrong. For Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. For this reason, since the day we heard about it, we have not stopped praying for you, asking specifically, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom, with insight into his purposes, and in understanding of spiritual things, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, displaying admirable character, moral courage, and personal integrity, <laughs> to fully please him in all things, bearing fruit in every walk, and steadily growing in the knowledge of God, with deeper faith, clearer insight, and fervent love for his precepts. That is thy kingdom come amplified. That those who have come and received Christ will not remain babes, but that they will grow and mature. That kingdom come can also manifest in a that the body imparts and makes it. This is the prayer of service. Thy kingdom come. That my journey and your journey will be influential enough to impact the world that we live in. That I will be useful enough by God. That God will deploy me in the place of service so that when I finish serving my constituency, God will be seen. He will be made known. Thy kingdom come. Hallelujah. When we pray thy kingdom come, we lay the spiritual foundation to live Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added. Hallelujah. The question is, of course, you know, you know the answer, but I said we will deal with it. What is my part in the kingdom of God coming? What is my part? And I've, I've, I've taken us to Genesis 1.28. Where God gave man the fivefold mandate. That is what we call the divine mandate to be fruitful. If you are a son of God and you are not producing, you are not a son of God. I don't know how else to say it. Every son of God, God had put something on the inside of him to bring forth. Hallelujah. If you want me to prove it to you, open to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let me first read verse number one. Verse one and two. Genesis chapter two, verse one and two. So the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested or ceased on the seventh day from all his work, which he has done. So essentially, by Genesis chapter two, verse two, God stopped working. I've said it many times here. If you don't understand it, pick up a copy of my book, The Theology of Work. God stopped working. God does not work anymore. And the simple reason why he doesn't work anymore is that he has you, he has me. So we are the one doing the work now. How do I know? Should I still prove it a bit more? Genesis chapter 2 verse 5. In Genesis 2 verse 5, the Bible says, No shrub or plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. If you see some other translation, we say, because there was no man to till the ground. 
Because God has ceased from work, grass must not grow because who we, who we cut the grass. So because grass must not grow, rain did not fall. And all of this is because there was no man. God, man had not manifested. He had created him, but he had not manifested. So if God allowed it to rain on the earth, there will be work, but no one to do it. So in verse 7, then the Lord formed, that is, created the body of man from the dust. From this, can you see, is the body that was now created, which meant that God had finished the spiritual work. He created the body of man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being and complete, an individual, complete in what? Body and spirit. Then, verse number 8. God planted a garden oasis in the east in Eden, the light land of happiness. And he put the man whom he had formed or created there. And in that garden, the Lord caused to grow from the ground. Remember in verse 5, nothing could grow. Now because man was now in the garden, God was now causing things to grow. He says in that garden, God crossed God caused to grow from the ground every tree that is desirable and pleasing to the sight and good, suitable for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the experiential knowledge, recognition of the difference between good and evil. It talks about the river that flowed in verse 10 and to 12 or verse 10 to 14 actually. Then when you see verse 15, it says, So the Lord took the man he had made. And settled him in the garden of Eden to do us, to cultivate and to keep it. What did I say was the greatest manifestation of the kingdom of God? When God put the man in the garden and gave him the charge to cultivate and keep it, what is that? God delegated authority to him. The authority of work God gave to man. He said, from now on me, I don't, I don't work again. Everything I would create, I have created a seed form and it's on the earth. Some of it is in you, some is in the ground, some is in the shrubs, some is in the tree. That's why everything that God created, he puts seed in it. Because otherwise, when the Uroko tree dies, God will have to create the Uroko tree all, the, all afresh. So he said, me, I don't walk again, no. Anything that will, repro that will grow again after me has a seed. So as long as the seed is in the ground, man, now you know what you want to do. If you want to cut it, grab it. If you want to do it. So in verse 15, he put man in the garden to tend it. And in verse 16, now commanded him saying, you may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge, recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience. So there is no authority without boundaries. That's why I said that the, the boundaries of the kingdom of God is not uh, mountains, it's not rivers, it's not valleys, it's not trees, it's not fences, it's not walls. The boundaries of the kingdom of God is the will of God. So when Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come, he wants you to make an informed decision. That when you open your mouth... What that means, as I'm thinking about it now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about it. What that means is the kingdom of God does not show up by accident. A man has to desire for the kingdom of God to come. And the kingdom of God will only come when a man is parametered by the will of God. Hallelujah. Because the kingdom of God is a culmination of God's kingdom. Com the combination of God's kingdom coming is proven in how we take charge in the earth. How we align with his will each day to bring what he shows us by his spirit to bear. How we walk in the grace that manifests his mind for the earth through us from time to time. The kingdom of God will manifest as witty inventions and ideas. The kingdom of God will manifest as work by which he commits wealth to his children. The kingdom of God will manifest as decrees to establish boundaries and to de declare and decree dominion. The kingdom of God will, would come when Christ is modeled in chaotic places. So in Genesis chapter 1, if we went back to verse 1 and 2, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. 
In verse 3 it says, and the earth was without form a void. And the spirit of God hovered in the face of the deep. And God said, let there be. That's kingdom. The moment God spoke and order showed up is kingdom. And I said that the greatest manifestation of kingdom is what? I don't want you to forget. That's why everything, my husband will say it like this, say the kingdom of God is voice activated. If you truly want to be around the kingdom and represent the kingdom, you have to be standing in the authority. But you cannot stand in the authority without being parameters by the will of God. The reason why the kingdom of God is not coming is because we have refused to be parameters by the will of God. He says, don't do it, you do it. He says, don't go, you go. He says, come, you don't come. Everything that restores all that to the earth, by how we live, by how we do, by how we be, that is the kingdom of God. And like I said, when the kingdom shows up, it is clear. You know, it's not seven of, but the difference is clear. Do you understand this? So the next time we say, let's say, our father, pick your words carefully. They may be very common words, but they are heavy. Look at three words, see what it means. You are declaring God now your side I did. God now your will I go do. God I no go go where you no send me. God I no go do this. God I go do that. God kick devil for me. Send me self. I won't kick him by myself. God whatever you do with my life I no care. As long as men go glorify your name. Can you see all the things that God Jesus packed into three words? Akoba, Adaba. Do you understand this? So when we come and we say, eh, our father, go out to heaven. Jesus, okay. But when they now shake you, when the kingdom wants to come, you begin to shout, hey, 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 my money, oh, my head, oh, my belly, oh, my head, oh, you start to do jaguanana for me. But this is what it means. We must. It's a necessity that the kingdom of God will be established. But, because God has ceased from his work, you and me are the ones. But it will take a heart that has embraced him. And we say, Lord, let your kingdom come. So that next week we look at your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because unless the kingdom of God shows up, the will of God cannot be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to begin to thank God if what you have heard today makes any kind of sense. And I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer only up to thy kingdom come. And let's pray it like we understand what it now means. So let's begin with our Father who art in heaven. Pray it in your own words. Our Father who art in heaven. Pray it in your own words. Our Father who art in heaven. Pray it in your own words. Our Father, who art in heaven, pray it in your own words. Our Father, who art in heaven, pray. What does it mean now? My Papa, where is he be my boss? My Papa, where is he be the God where they spit fire from his nose? My Papa, where is he be the God where if he kill and make a life? My Papa, my family member, where is he get power past anything? Hallowed be your name. Baba, make your name work for me. If I seek for my body, let Jehovah Rapha work for me. If something exposes me, make Jehovah Nisi work for me. If men forsake me, make Jehovah Eroi work for me. Make you see me, oh God. Hallowed be your name. I they hail your name. Your name too much. Your name get power. Your name not stand alone name. Not in way we feel at, not in way we feel carry come off for that name. Ah! Thy kingdom come. God, use me. Oh. Send me anywhere you want me to go. As long as I still breathe, oh God. Anything where you want to do with my life, I agree. As long as men go see, women go see, children go see, they go know that you, now you be Baba. 
I say, make your kingdom come. Oh. Make your kingdom come. Oh. God, just give, just give, just give the command now. I go follow. Your boy and your girl, we did loyally. We don't want to go anywhere else. Make your kingdom come. Make it be say everywhere where we go, if they say waiting happen, it's that Jesus happen. Pray it in your own words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Whether you are in this room or you are out there and you are yet to give your life to Jesus, you cannot pray these both prayers we have prayed this evening unless you have given your life to Christ. What does it entail, Sister B? The Bible says, with the heart a, a man believes, and with the mouth he confesses unto salvation. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus, pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life because my heart believes. Can I get the communion? Even as we go on to begin to break the bread and to sanctify the communion table, Lord, that what it means for your kingdom to come will begin to manifest in our lives. Lord, wherever we go, let it not be in doubt that your manifest authority is resident in us. Let us live in your delegated authority. Let us make a difference. Let it be that we are parametered by your will. And let men know without a doubt that you are the God of heaven. We'll break this bread and we'll sanctify this wine in the name of God the Father, name of God the Son, and name of God the Holy Spirit. Father, that even in this week, oh God, as we steward the altar of wrath for you, Father, Lord, that by this communion you will do exceedingly abundantly above. That you deploy us for work, oh God, that we did not know we had capacity for. And that your spirit will step in to do the work. Also that your glory will come to your name. Lord, we worship you. As we eat in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your way in me, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my all. Before you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give Father you Lord, my you. life. Father, Lord, we give you praise. Father, we exhort you. Have your way, dear King. Have your way, dear King. We are yielded to you, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen.